Wow, what a crazy week it has been for Space News. Over the past seven days, we saw an unprecedented amount of activity down at SpaceX's Starbase, a whole bunch of rocket launches from around the globe, including another robotic moon landing mission with two rovers, an ocean launch from China, and so much more. Strap in, it's gonna be a busy one. And this episode was sponsored by Manscaped. More on them a little bit later on, but first, let's kick off with Starship updates. We left Starbase news last week with Ship 25 and Booster 9 armed for liftoff and we're anticipating imminent rollout of Ship 25 and subsequent stacking on the booster. And not long after my video went live, that's exactly what happened. The chopsticks were opened up on Monday afternoon and a few hours later we saw two self-propelled modular transporters move in on Ship 25 which then carried the Starship to the launch pad on what we expect to be its final ever rollout. It arrived at the pad in the early hours of Tuesday morning and SpaceX wasted no time at all in getting it hooked up to the chopsticks and then raised to the top of the tower. You can see a SpaceX drone hovering nearby the vehicle's aft section, tail pen sure proper alignment as the ship was swung over the top of Super Heavy Booster 9 and then it was lowered down and stacked and with the stacking complete, SpaceX broke the record for tallest ever launch vehicle assembled, breaking the record set by Ship 24 and Booster 7, which of course were a bit shorter thanks to the fact that there was no hot staging ring on Booster 7, which adds a few feet to the vehicle's overall height. The following day, the booster quick disconnect arm was attached to the ship's quick disconnect interface before conducting a full speed retraction test just under an hour later. Another fun test we saw at the launch pad last week was another test of the FireX suppression system. Anyway, while we're probably not going to see the ship rolled back to the build site area again, hopefully, we should see it de-stacked at least one more time before launch because it's not yet had its flight termination system armed. So, with SpaceX already and waiting to launch Booster 9 and Ship 25 on the second integrated flight test of Starship, we were all pretty hyped for Starship Flight Test 2 last week. After all, the rocket was fully stacked, fully tested, and SpaceX themselves confirmed that it was ready for launch. All they needed was a launch license from the FAA. But this still hasn't been granted, and we got an answer as to why last week. On Friday, the FAA tweeted that they had only just closed their investigation into Flight Test 1 and that they weren't yet signing off approval for future Starship launches, and that there was a list of 63 corrective actions that needed to be taken. It wasn't disclosed what these corrective actions were until Elon just straight up shared the entire thing on Twitter. Yep, in an unfortunately surprising break from Norm these days, Elon posted some actually good tweets last week. Here it is. I'll stick it all on the screen for you to pause if you want to read it for yourself. But I think some notable points are C32, which is add electric actuation system, which is in relation to the fact that the booster now uses electric motors to gimbal its engines rather than hydraulics. Though Ship 25 will still be using hydraulics, but it is the final ship to do so. Speaking of the engines though, there are a lot of items on this list in relation to improving engine reliability, which isn't too surprising since the first Starship flight test ended in the vehicle experiencing multiple engines out, losing altitude and then tumbling over and over. According to Elon, all necessary items for Flight Test 2 have now been completed. The remaining items are for future flights. And remember, this list is from SpaceX, not the FAA. The FAA just oversee and work with SpaceX. So hopefully this means we will see a launch very soon. I'm going to cross my fingers for this week, hopefully. <laughs> Although there's no license yet, at least at the time of me writing this script. But the launch license for Flight Test 1 was only granted one day prior, so it's not like there's going to be a long period between launch license acquisition and guaranteed excitement. <laughs> What's not on the list of improvements is the landscaping at Starbase. One advantage of the wetlands location of Starbase is that SpaceX don't have to worry too much about landscaping. But the same should never be said about you and I. And that's why Manscaped are here to help and have sponsored today's video. Fellas, we all know the drill. Juggling haircuts, hitting the gym and watching what we eat. But here's a thought. Have you ever considered the benefits of taking care of things, well, down there? You're going to need the right tools. So put down those scissors and step away from the tweezers because I've got three solid reasons why you need to check out Manscaped and they're all here in their Performance Package 4.0. Body hair can trap bacteria, sweat and dirt. 
leading to unwanted odors and infections. Enter the Lawnmower 4.0, a waterproof cordless body hair trimmer with ceramic blades that keep your sensitive areas nick free and fresh. The Lawnmower's trimmer guards and LED light let you handle even the trickiest spots with ease. And don't forget the Weed Whacker 2.0, a nose and ear hair trimmer that takes care of business with its powerful motor, upgraded cutting performance and battery life for days. Manscaped even has deodorants for your underarms and lower regions. Say hello to the Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant, because nothing says confidence like an all-day freshness that lasts through the summer heat. Studies have shown that grooming boosts your confidence. Looking your best translates to success. And speaking of success, Manscaped has hooked me up with everything I need, plus two free gifts, the Shed Travel Bag and High Performance Boxer Briefs. So if you're ready to level up your grooming game, head on over to manscapes.com to get 20% off plus free international shipping by using the promo code LOWN20 at checkout. Elevate your grooming routine, boost your confidence and put your best foot forward. Thank you to Manscaped for helping us all look and feel our best. Despite the fact that SpaceX proclaimed Booster 9 and Ship 25 ready for launch, things didn't look too peachy with the water deluge system last week. So I doubt any delay that might have stopped the launch from happening last week was directly caused by the FAA. The water deluge system is required for a launch, yet on Thursday, workers were seen dismantling part of the system, removing a water tank manifold and disconnecting the water tanks from the system. Luckily, a replacement manifold arrived later in the day, as well as the Versabar lifting jig, which is used to reposition the water tanks. We later saw this in action, with the crane and lifting jig used to reposition the third large water tank, which at present is not plumbed into the system. With Super Heavy 9 rolled out in preparation for launch, we were wondering which we'd see rolled out next, and it looks like this was answered yesterday. Booster 10 was rolled out of the Mega Bay and sent off to the Macy's site for testing. But wait, didn't Booster 10 already do a stint of testing down at the Macy's site back in July? Well, yes, it did, but this was only propellant load testing, or cryoproofing. The booster didn't undergo any structural tests, which is what we believe this latest rollout is for. The booster was placed on top of the thrust simulator stand yesterday, which of course is designed to simulate the forces that these vehicles will be subjected to during a launch. Booster 10 wasn't the only vehicle rolled out last week. Everyone's favourite naked starship, Ship 26, was rolled out from the Rocket Garden to the launch site. We're still not 100% sure what the purpose of this vehicle is, but one leading theory is that it's a Starship tanker prototype, and it's going to perform propellant transfer tests in orbit, presumably on Starship Flight Test 3. Given that there's no tiles or flaps to damage, SpaceX may well just leave this vehicle on site during the launch of Booster 9 and Ship 25. SpaceX are wasting no time on building more Super Heavies. On Tuesday, we saw a Booster 13 common dome section and liquid oxygen tank brought into the Mega Bay, and the two were then stacked together. Future Starships continue to grow as well. Ship 31's forward dome was moved into the high bay on Thursday. Mega Bay 2 is now at full height. Last week, we saw its two large roof truss sections installed. Hopefully now, it won't be too long before we see this structure completed and vehicles begin assembly inside. Ship 22's nose cone, which has been repurposed as a human landing system prototype, was painted white last week, bringing it closer to the real HLS's intended aesthetic, though the real lander won't have heat shield tiles. Those are just left over from when this was the nose cone for a vehicle intended for orbital flight and re-entry. With the recent dismantling of the historic Ship 15, we all feared the worst for Ship 20. This was the original Starship expected for the first integrated flight test. It was the first to have a full heat shield, and I think it's somewhat fair to call it, and it's assigned Super Heavy Booster 4, the first real Starship. But our hearts sunk as we saw workers descend onto the vehicle last week and patch it up. Yes, its lifting points were removed and the empty spots were filled in with tiles, something usually done right before flight. What does this mean? Remember, Ship 20 and Booster 4 are now very outdated. They still use Raptor 1 and of course are now incompatible with the launch pad and Ship 20 itself can't be mounted to any other Super Heavy. So what gives? Perhaps this was an exercise in practicing the removal of lifting points, something that seems a bit redundant now since new ships don't have these same lifting points to begin with, or, and this is my theory, Ship 20 and Booster 4 are set to be put on display, Saturn V style perhaps, 
possibly either at Starbase itself, Brownsville Airport, or somewhere else entirely. What do you think SpaceX will do with Ship 20? Let me know your theories in the comments section down below. And hey, if you are enjoying the video so far, then don't forget to leave a like. It really helps me out and all that. Anyway, we only saw one Falcon 9 launch last week, and this was, of course, exclusively streamed on X, so sorry for the terrible video quality, but this was Starlink Mission 6-14, which saw the rocket lift off from Space Launch Complex 40 at Kennedy on Saturday and deliver 22 Starlink V2 minis to Starlink Shell 6 in low Earth orbit. The first stage made a successful landing on the shortfall of Gravitar's drone ship in the Atlantic Ocean, closing up its seventh overall flight. Another exciting launch we saw last week was carried out by a United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket, launched in the 551 configuration. It launched on Sunday from Kennedy's Space Launch Complex 41, and its payload was the Silent Barker on the Enrol 107 mission. According to ULA, Silent Barker is a joint national reconnaissance office and US Space Force capability to improve space domain awareness. And given its classified nature, that's all we really know about the payload. Interestingly, this was the final National Reconnaissance Office mission on ULA's Atlas V rocket. Hopefully it won't be too long before we see Atlas V's successor, the Vulcan, make its maiden flight. We had three launches from China last week. In order, the first was on Tuesday and was a very interesting one. This was the first Ceres 1S launch vehicle lifting off from its sea platform in Shandong province for the first time. It carried four Internet of Things Tianqi satellites. This mission was designated the Little Mermaid and was by all accounts a success. The second Chinese launch was a Long March 4C launch on Wednesday, which lifted off from the Qiquan Satellite Launch Center in Gansu Province, carrying the Yaogan 3303 remote sensing satellite. Now, according to official sources, the satellite has reached its intended orbit successfully and will mainly be used in the fields of scientific experimental research, marine and land resource census, agricultural product production estimation, and disaster prevention and mitigation. Although this is widely understood to be a cover, the Yaogan series of satellites are designed for military reconnaissance. The third and final Chinese launch took place on Sunday. This time it was a Long March 6A carrying the Yaogan 40 satellite to low Earth orbit from the Taiwan Satellite Launch Center in Shaanxi Province. Again, this is expected to be a military reconnaissance satellite, though official sources state that it will be used for electromagnetic environment detection and related technical tests. Moving away from China, but staying in Asia, we saw a launch from Japan's Tanegashima Space Center on Wednesday. This was an H-2A-202 rocket carrying some very cool payloads. It carried the X-RISM Low Earth Orbit X-ray Astronomy Satellite, developed by both NASA and JAXA. Also aboard were some payloads destined for the surface of the Moon. Chiefly, the Smart Lander for Investigating Moon, or just Slim, Moon Lander was on board and contained within are two lunar rovers. The first is a lunar rover which will move around using a hopping mechanism and carries a thermometer, radiation monitor and inclinometer, as well as a couple of cameras. The second rover is a tiny 250 gram rover and is equipped with two small cameras. It's the second rover of its kind to attempt a lunar mission after the first one was destroyed on the Hakuto R Mission 1 when the lander crashed into the lunar surface. I'm looking forward to following along with this latest robotic moon mission. It's weird how we suddenly seem to be seeing lots of these happening all at once. That was the final orbital launch we saw last week, but we did see a sub-orbital launch on Friday. This was Virgin Galactic's third commercial spaceflight, which saw the spacecraft VSS Unity and its carrier aircraft take off from Spaceport America in New Mexico, carrying three private passengers, as well as Beth Moses, Virgin Galactic's chief astronaut instructor. The spacecraft reached an apogee of 55 miles, or 88 and a half kilometers, which is above the United States' definition of the border of space, 50 miles up, but just short of the internationally recognized Kármán line of 100 kilometers. We saw more Ariane 6 testing last week. Ariane Group conducted a hot fire test of the rocket's core stage on the launch pad at the Guiana Space Center on Tuesday. The test simulated an entire launch sequence, which concluded with four seconds of stabilized operation of the core stage's Vulcane 2.1 engine. Laon Aerospace was back in action last week. I sent a miniature five crew space shuttle to the surface of the MUN, and it's going to be a busy week ahead. I plan to upload some Kerbal content on both Wednesday and Saturday, if all goes to plan. So make sure you've smashed that subscribe button and turned on channel notifications so that you don't miss out on those. I'm really happy with how they're shaping up. But other than that, that's it from me today. 
Whew, it has been a super busy episode, and it was all possible thanks to both Manscaped for sponsoring this video, and thanks to my Patreon and channel members. Their names are on the left, and if you want to sign up, then follow the card on screen or the links below. But again, that's it. Thank you so much for watching. There's two video suggestions on that screen that YouTube thinks you'll like. I hope they're good choices for you. Maybe one of them is that mini space shuttle. Anyway, I've said my piece. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you on Wednesday, my dudes.